And we're back. Welcome back to another great episode here at TTTV, your source for the truth. This is TTTV, the podcast, the broadcast, broadcasting from Bottom Earth Studios here down with the bunny rabbits as low as we can go to the bottom of the totem pole because we are the ones that the dogs kind of sniff around, get excited. <laughs> yeah i mean the you can't go any lower than us it's no exaggeration either to say that we are the limbo brothers because we go below the waist well we go to the bottom of the totem pole for sure we're at the shoe level but we hope everybody's doing great today <laughs> But we have a lot of things on today's episode. As you guys can see, it is episode 98 here at the TTTV podcast, Waste Walkers. <laughs> <laughs> Waste Baskets. Yeah, and we'll get more into that in a little bit. We're going to break down what is the financial situation that's going on right now and what is going to happen soon within the future. I'll say within, I'm telling you, whoever... And I, it doesn't matter who it is. Whoever becomes president this, this next session. It's going to be Biden. Or whoever it is, they're going to be the ones that have to deal with the waste walkers. And we'll get more into why. But this has been going on since 2008. They haven't really fixed the quandary that was part of the cause. They just put a Band-Aid with the bailouts. But we are now going to face it again. In a different way. And I think it was all premeditated, and we'll get into why this is ultimately going to turn into the Waste Walkers. But we'll get into that in a little bit. But before we do, please hit that like button as always, right now. If you have uh, the opportunity to push that button, smash that thumbs up button, we appreciate that. As we a, want you to love the like button. Yeah, it's just like a sign of some currency, the sign of submission. It's a sign of appreciation. <laughs> um, subscribe if you haven't had a chance to. Subscribe to the channel. That helps us also. And obey. Yeah. Don't put on the sunglasses if you're looking at the eclipse. I know there was many people that was encouraging people to look at the eclipse. They tell us not to look at this solar eclipse that's about to happen on April 8th. But they also tell us not to look directly at the sun because it has spiritual benefits. The eyes are the windows to the soul. Sun gazing is good, and so is looking at this solar eclipse with your eyes, no glasses. There's this uh, TikTok that was going on, and they were looking at the Google search results uh, right after the eclipse. And the number one search result is, why is my eyes hurting? Google searches for why do my eyes hurt surge after solar eclipse. Here's what happened. Internet searches for terms about eye pain surged after Monday's solar eclipse that had spectators looking at the sky across the country. According to Google Trends, which tracks the volume of certain search terms, quote, my eyes hurt and quote, why do my eyes hurt spiked significantly as the solar eclipse's shadow passed over the country. The terms eye pain and my eyes hurt surged strongest among Google users in states where the total eclipse could be seen from Texas to Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. This eye pain is most likely caused from staring at the sun or wearing incorrect glasses while watching the eclipse. If that was you, you may have damaged your eyes by looking directly at the sun and you might be experiencing solar retinopathy. There was a lot of people <laughs> that uh, decided to just go ahead and start looking at the sun anyways just during the eclipse. Raw. And uh, that's, our, that's our society. Oh. They obeyed. But anyways, uh, we'll get more into that in a little bit. We have a interesting conspiracy that we ran into earlier this week that we're going to discuss a little bit. So we have a lot of things on the tab. So as like I was saying, hit subscribe if you haven't so you can get more of this content. And also consider hitting that join button at the bottom of your screen if you don't see it. In the comment section, you'll see also a link to join and become a TTTV member that helps support us financially to continue bringing more content like this. And also, if you listen to audio podcasts, you can check us out on all the platforms at TTTV, the podcast. But before we get into all these other things, we need to figure out 
What is in the mysterious bottom earth? Bottom rabbit hole. Bottom of the totem pole tab. That Mr. Colleague has hidden. I found a boy online. On TikTok specifically. Handling a spider with no fear. I've never seen anything like this before. Even trained professionals. Uh... <laughs> They don't do stuff like this. You know, they have protection and all this stuff. So, uh, I thought you guys might want to see this too. If you have a fear of arachnophobias, or if you have arachnophobia, a fear of spiders, then you probably want to turn your eyes away. Treat it like the sun clips. Why did he just scoop that up like a kid reaching for a goldfish snack? He is manhandling a tarantula he just found in the wild and is literally trying to pick its fangs out with his bare hands. Olha para o tamanho dessas fusículas. Vejam só, parece ferrões de morcegos. Olham. Vai, encosta o dedo aqui pra você ver. Nossa. E agora, vou mostrar pra vocês se ela vai ferroar ou a madeira. Ferroa, vai, 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 vai. Olha o tamanho dessas fusículas. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's indoctrination or if that's something that America should embrace more. Yeah, fears may be learned, like some people are saying in the comments. You know, I, I do believe that, but I don't know. There is there is some weird fears I've noticed with my kids that they they are genuinely nobody taught them to be afraid of certain things. They just naturally are. Now you can call it a byproduct of evolution or whatever, but that kid apparently, you know, he skipped some generations apparently. So I thought I, th I thought I would be interested in uh, you know seeing what the comments said, kind of like what Jurassic Par Park boy said. So yeah, put in the comments how you feel about all that. Well, another thing that I noticed that was pretty interesting was I don't know if you guys have ever thought about this, and I got I ran across it I ran across it on accident. I was reading a dissertation this past week by an Australian medical journal. That was talking about the link between long COVID and the vaccine itself um, and all the documentations that go around that. So it's a peer reviewed journal. But while I was reading that, there was somebody, one of the people, there were many people that were in con contributing to this uh, journal article. It was like volume four. And um, one of the people were talking about older pandemics that occurred. And then there was this great fire during one of the time one of these pandemics. So while I was looking up that fire so I could look at what was happening during this pandemic, I just, uh, all of a sudden my search showed another great fire. So then I looked up that, which then it led to another one and another one and another one. And I was like, what in the world is all this? And so here's this weird scheme and I'll, I'll show it to you guys here. So there was the Great Fire of New York in 1835. And then there's the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871. And then there's a the Great Fire of Seattle in 1889. And then there's the Great Fire of Atlanta, 1917. And then there's the Great Fire of Baltimore, the Great Fire of Michigan, the Great Fire of Boston, the Great Fire of Spokane, the Great Fire of Pittsburgh, the Great Fire of Los Angeles, the Great Fire of Jacksonville. There's literally great fires going on Whoa. infinitively. And so I was trying to figure out what in the world is going on and why would this, and it seems like ever since about 1820 or 1830 to about 1930, every single large city, everyone, and you guys can look it up and it's, it's absolutely coincidental or conspiratorial that they all have these fires. So the question that remains is conspiratorially. What kind of conveniences does this allow the government through the means of accidental fires? And because it was within a range of sequential events, it's, it's hard to believe that they were all just random, accidental. 
It's kind of like how we saw all those lightning bolts that were starting fires in Canada, but they all just happened within like a 15 minute span and lightning bolts just kind of hit. It's like, you know, it's random. That's okay. But if they're like within this line, it's within 15 minutes and the spread is like hundreds and hundreds of miles. It gets harder to believe that was random and accidental. I'm sure there's probably some kind of really uh, organized uh, conspiracy out there. But I think you guys can see how this could be really utilized. If the government had a bunch of manuscripts, artifacts, historical documents, things that they didn't want to proceed in the future, all they have to do is burn it. Oh, the library got burned. Oh, the museum got burned. Oh, this got burned. Oh, you know, it's all gone, guys, you know. And then within a hundred years, which it clearly has been longer than that, nobody will be able to prove nobody's going to be alive as a first eyewitness testimony of anything. So you can say whatever you want, but nobody's going to believe it. They're going to say, yeah, that, that, no, there's no evidence of that. So I don't, I don't know what you guys are thinking about that, but you guys can look it up. Every city, man, it's absolutely insane. So... I was, I was thinking, you know, <clears throat> most people don't even know the first president wasn't George Washington. The first president actually was Jan Hancock, John Hancock, and he was actually president twice. Uh, the first was, I think it was because before the Constitution was ratified, I think it was 1789, uh, it was the Continental Congress, but the president of that was John Hancock. And of course, you know, they're, they're not, they don't. They don't publicize, it's not hidden information, but they don't publicize that on purpose. And all on reason I'm saying that is not because that's secret. It's just those illusionary facts of what else. If they don't want you to know something and there is no <laughs> evidence because it all got burned. Literally, there's absolute, it's like the Library of Alexandria because it got burned. We can't really know. There was supposed to be like in Italy, this secondary library that's supposed to have copies of majority of what was in the Library of Alexandria, but we don't know. It's the same thing today. They say, oh, we preserved a lot of this stuff, but you don't know. Well, look what happened to uh, NASA's moon landing evidence. Oh, yeah, that all yeah. got burned. Yeah, we don't, we don't have the t uh, telemetry. Yeah, yeah we, we don't know how to make rockets out of duct tape anymore. So, with a, a, a real, on a real note, though, there is an interesting thing I always thought was interesting in this line of thought, which is uh, the oldest Hebrew manuscript called the Aleppo Codex was actually burned the year before Israel became a nation. In 1948. Yeah. It was, it was burned in 1947 mm -hmm. in anti-Jewish riots. And I've always thought that was interesting. So now we have to rely on other manuscripts because this one was in pristine condition, but it got burned in this massive riot fire in 1947. And then Israel became a nation the, year, the next year. So I thought that was an interesting thing. And a lot of things actually happened in 1948 surrounding the Judaic religion. So... Maybe it's the Hebrew nationalists who make us hot dogs and stuff. I don't know. Well, I talked about it before. There, and it's not hidden again. And I, I said, I think I said Rothschild or, you know, whoever, or Rockefeller. But it, it was, uh, it was, um, it was the Rothschilds. I think I said some other name. But in 1917, and I'm, I'm just trying to remember, my brain's a little foggy. But there's a documentary, you guys can look it up. It's uh, the Rothschilds, they were, um, there was a letter written to Lord Rothschild and he was, I think it was by a, uh, somebody within the British administration asking his assistance to help ratify the nation or to quantify a ratified nation in the Middle East as Israel. And specifically in the letter to help expand and quantify Zionism. And this was, you know, during the 1917, during World War I to World War II. Now, really, was that whole construct a boogeyman deterrent so they could quantify Israel as a nation? That's a whole nother conspiracy. But, you know, connecting to the idea, anything that they wanted to promote their Zionism, they probably deleted. So, yeah, they could easily use that fire. As a means, there's probably multiple things, you know, what we know compared to mm -hmm. what actually got destroyed. Yeah, the fire is the easiest way. Once it's burned, it's gone. It's just gone. Yeah, I'm waiting for the other manuscripts to get burned, too, in some accidental fires. But you said they all stopped at a certain point? 
Yeah, you, you notice that. I mean, think about it today. How often do you hear about whole cities burning down? Like you hear, you know, sometimes when the FBI is trying to investigate something, a, a, a house will blow up, you know, from a meth lab or something, yeah. and it'll burn a couple, it'll blow up a couple houses, of course. But you don't hear about whole cities. These are great fires that literally burn down whole cities, like the, everything. And, you know, there was that fire in the White House. I think the, I don't remember if it was the British, but they set the White House on fire, I think, in 1812 or something. And who knows what was burnt in there? And they, they say, oh, it was, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, insurrection. a, a ter- terrorist plot, of course, by the British or whatever. It was probably Trump. But it's no different than any false flag operation. You know, you blame your boogeymen, like uh, Operation Northwood. You're going to blame Cuba for something. But the government itself is attacking its own country. So, therefore, it's like Nero, you know, the same thing. Oh, look at the Christians or look at these people. They're the ones burning all this stuff down. Or we're going to blame some boogeyman when secretly it's yourself to, you know, it's a Machiavellian idea. So, I just thought it was interesting. You guys can look more into it. All these great fires and you guys can tell us what you think is the reasoning behind all that. But it's not Fugazi. Are they all called great fire, the great fire of whatever? Yeah, I'll show you guys again. Yeah, it's interesting if they're all labeled the great, so you know where to start. All the great fires of... As you guys can see right here on the screen. Great fire of New York. Great fire of Chicago. Great fire of Seattle. Great fire of Atlanta. Great fire of Baltimore. Great fire of Michigan. Great fire of Boston. Great fire of Spokane. Great fire of Pittsburgh. Great fire of Los Angeles. Great fire of Jacksonville. Great balls of fire. Yeah, it's, it's all there. So that's just what they're called. And so... Who knows what we have lost on purpose for whatever means. Clearly, the way to get rid of it is through all these great fires. Well, I would even say not just in the U.S. It's probably happening uh, globally because Aleppo is in Israel. It's not in uh, America. So I'm sure there's a lot of such fires going on all over the world. Yeah, during that time period, there's another great fire. It's called the Great Fire of London. And there's, so there's many of these great fires. And if you just think about the circulating universal government, if any, if there's a collusion between the British and America, like if America's, if the British use the pilgrims objective to isolate away from England as a guise, like the pilgrims really maybe had this objective, but the British used that as a means to establish the expansion of colon or colonization of America. You see what I'm saying? The pilgrims really did come to America and they really were trying to get away from England so they could have their independency. But then the, the British used that as a means to say, okay, let's, let's, you know, basically a, a, a Benedict Arnold kind of situation, a double spy. Let's propagate more Christian missionaries under the guise of following this Puritan idea as a means to start new colonies in America. So then you get these 13 colonies. But really, instead of them being Christian missionaries, a lot of them were under the guise of British spies to colonize America. And they just utilized the expansion that was established by the pilgrims. And so now what America is really is just British Empire rule. But they just use the independency that the pilgrims are trying to establish and to ratify some of this hidden boogeyman, because maybe there's a lot of documents still were here. We can just start fires and burn all this junk and nobody would ever know. And then everybody's still going to believe America is actually independent, isolated away from Britain. So, yeah, I was going to say, did we learn it from Hitler or did Hitler learn it from us? Well, totalitarianism has been around eons and, you know, great leaders are easily one step away from being Machiavellian. Well, anyways, it's an interesting thought. You guys tell us more what you think in the comments in the chat, but also if I could add one more thing to the, uh, great fires, you know, that, that is one of those things that someone was, uh, blowing a whistle on museums for burning giant remains and giant, uh, archeological evidence. Like what, you know, when you see archeologists discover giant, uh, swords giant spears giant bows and arrows stuff that a normal size human couldn't literally hold during a battle um you can't look at those in any museums so you know the museums got called out by this guy saying that they were burning giant bones and giant artifacts 
And then that guy later on came out and said, oh, hey, guys, it was just a joke. I was just joking. You know, it was just a joke. It's satire and all that. But yet we still don't have any of the artifacts that we can go look at in any museum. So it makes you wonder. So yeah, the fires are you know, good for destroying a lot of stuff. And look at 9-11 with, you know, thermite or whatever. Everyone, you know, clearly I got to got to be tiptoeing around that but it's fires man it's just so interesting that one way or another when you start looking at how these fires are connected it's almost like it's a it's almost like a breadcrumb like when you start looking at fires that are global or larger you can almost find governmental collusion there you just find the fires but anyway, it's just interesting and again i found it on just an accident but I'm sure there's probably a larger collusion out there somewhere. But anyways, show us more what's on your truth. I've been hearing about um, copper pyramids. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has heard of these. Maybe people have. But specifically putting food inside of a, a copper lined pyramid. Um, I have a picture I can throw up right I've been seeing a lot of that lately. I guess it's, uh, you know, in to put your food underneath the inside of a copper pyramid. I guess it preserves your food. I haven't tried this. Um, I, I'm curious about it. If anybody in the comments section could tell me if it actually works. When I looked it up, uh, apparently you can buy these on Amazon. You could also buy human sized ones where you could actually sit underneath it yourself. And it's supposed to um, help uh, for meditation, energy healing, clear negative energies, and the like. There's, I guess it's supposed to help you self-reflect, which I don't know. I mean, I don't want to sound too crass, but it does seem like, you know, if you need help self-reflecting, <laughs> you probably shouldn't buy this pyramid probably just buy a mirror i don't know <clears throat> is that all they're saying about it is that it's utilized for uh meditation and food health well yeah which is pretty big i mean that's almost the size of john of james peach if you can if you can handle all of that peach and apparently if you put a peach inside this pyramid it'll preserve it so that's what's really cool because i was thinking like you can get rid of your refrigerator you can get rid of anything really that's that you're using to store food just get a giant pyramid and put all your food into it and it'll preserve it for you it's kind of like you know when people are saying that if you uh walk around barefoot then you can you know uh change your energy to align with the ener the uh, electrical magnetic field of the earth but they forgot that all you have to do is really just be like monk and you can just touch metal objects a metal chain link fence will do the job Anything that's connected to the ground, you can just touch it. You don't need to take your shoes off. So you can have the best of both worlds. You can have your Kate and your Edith, and you can even have your cake and you can eat it. Yeah, that's, that's I don't know, that, that's kind of strange. If you walk into somebody's house and you see this, this empty pyramid with a, like a fruit underneath, getting ionized. No, why not? Yeah, I mean, Amazon, actually, if you go to Amazon right now, they sell them. This one is actually called um, Copper Meditation Pyramid for Self-Healing and Heart Chakra Activation. The description, you know, it says it's Giza shaped. <laughs> <laughs> so that's legit. I mean, it's a pyramid. No, that's good. And I remember when you talking about the top of the pyramid back in like our first episode where you say, you know, the people on top of the pyramid, it was like a large toilet or something. So everything <laughs> yeah. could flow down to the bottom yeah, of the because, pyramid. And it was like their modern um, gutter system. As they say, poop always rolls downhill. Who says that? Everybody that I know. And that's why they say the poop runs downhill. Yeah, because anything that bad happens, the one on the top of the pyramid, the CEO, poops on everybody else down the pyramid defecation always flows downhill so or you know another way to look at it is the bottom of the totem pole 
because that's what gets peed on. Well, the question is, is that's what's going to happen to these fruits and vegetables. You know, if it is true, I'd love to know about it. And because, you know, how much electricity you can save and refrigerator costs. Like, yeah, wouldn't that be cool if you go into your friend's house and they don't have a refrigerator? They have a pyramid in the place of the refrigerator. Yeah, you have to clean all the nasty stains that the refrigerator left on the wall and the the burn stains and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean. No, well, the only issue is, is, of course, you also have to clean off all the mold and all the rotten food and the decaying meat and, uh, you know, your spoiled milk and everything else that comes along without refrigerating food. It's a small price to pay when rotting food is a thing of the past. Yeah, I don't know about all that. I do, I do know copper has uh, antimicrobial properties. That's why it's interesting that they... And, you know, you can say it's a conspiracy or not. And there's multiple layers. Like, I've heard people talk because, you know, there was lead in your pipes. I mean, lead in your paint. So some people, because they have this technology where they can, you know, see your images through your Wi-Fi using a secondary program called Dense Pose, which basically the Wi-Fi goes out, hits your body, and there's a form of resistance when it hits your body. And then dense poses make these little dots of these resistant points whenever the Wi-Fi hits your body. And it creates like an outline of your body. Um, but that's already inside your house. But I guess if the satellites were coming in and you had lead paint or, you know, lead, lead on your roof or something. Copper pipes. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, if, the more metal you have, the harder it is for, you know, a wireless signal to penetrate to your house. So the idea was some people were thinking the reason why they really wanted to get rid of lead was because they wanted to have better penetration into people's homes. I would say it's pretty proven that lead was a big contribution to a uh, degradation of IQ levels. When you look, because lead used to be in gasoline. And so these gasoline fumes were going all over the place. That's why now we have unleaded gas. And during that time frame, between I think like the 60s and the 80s or the 70s, they saw a, a drop, a tremendous drop in IQ and other neurodivergent issues arise like autisms and other things and a lot of that contribution was so much lead poisoning because it was so so largely propagated in the fumes and the oxygen that we're breathing every day so the idea is that well, it was lead in your paint clearly if children were eating that or other things that would contribute to that that's why lead can't be in toys and other things but then copper itself <clears throat> is not bad for us it does have antimicrobial properties and so the other conspiracy is is that's why they wanted to convert everything into cpvc piping and pex piping and plastic derivative pipings so they can create a more uh infertile society that gets contaminated with these forever chemicals that are within cpvc and pvc piping and get away from copper which has a more antimicrobial property so that, i mean that's a theory too well, the, a lot of people have speculated that the government actually took away all the lead from our paint and toys and everything else because it was actually making us smarter. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy that. But, uh, you know, for those who want to try drinking mercury and lead and all those other things, you guys can tell us how that works out for you. Well, on the flip side, I will say this is kind of strange. A lot of people have been finding these little tiny uh, lead particles in uh, Gerber food specifically and uh, other kinds of food. And maybe that's the sparkles or the glitter that we, you know, we all lost. We were trying to figure out where the glitter is going. And maybe that's what they're doing. And the material, they're not letting us know what kind of material it is. Maybe it is lead. And maybe they're putting it inside of our baby formulas. Because this one lady is uh, going viral. She's going around. She's taking a, a magnet and... Um, putting it near uh, Gerber baby food and you can actually see all the little tiny uh, metal sh shavings moving out of the food as she moves the magnet. She's tried it with other foods and it doesn't work on other brands. Did you know that they add metal shards to baby food? As you can see in this video, this woman rubs a magnet on top of her baby's oatmeal and as you can see there are tons of little shards of metal inside of the oatmeal. 
And so you know how to give this a try and see if this is actually real. So I grabbed myself some of that Gerber oatmeal, the same brand as well. And I'm going to put it inside of this Ziploc bag. I'm going to open it up. And I don't know if this is actually going to work, but if it is, can somebody please explain to me why there are shards of metal inside of the baby food? I have the Neodymium uh, World's Strongest Magnet. I'm going to rub it on top of the oatmeal. I did it in like a shadowy part. Uh, I was already feeling some resistance, so I put it to the sun so I could see better with the camera. And I'm here rubbing it on top as well. As you can see, the bag kind of like moves. You can kind of see the shards huh? starting to pick up. And the bag is levitating when I rub it. And look at that. Yo! There's a ton of little shards of metal. Can somebody in the comments let me know what is going on? They're saying that's iron, and we need iron in our body. But uh, if that's the case, she shows how these other uh, competitors... Um, say that there's iron, high doses of iron in them, but they're not having these little tiny metal shavings. So it does make you wonder. Now, maybe she's uh, working for the CIA. Yeah, now if it's... But I don't think so. If, if they're uh, composites of iron and stuff, that makes sense. But nobody, nobody is talking about... <laughs> if anybody found lead in food, that's like, you, I mean, you're getting money. That's instant. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you cook stuff in your cast iron pan you get iron's not that toxic high levels it can be well but a lot of people in america have iron deficiencies that's why they're anemic and other things i mean you can tell by your fingernails I mean, it's, you're just low on iron and iron's not that bad all they have to do is start eating gerber baby food because there's so much iron you could actually see that with your naked <laughs> eyes unlike the eclipse you could actually see that with your naked eye. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know if we need to like, go outside and bite a piece of steel. But <laughs> What I can't figure out is who's lying. Whose lying is it anyway? Is it the other brands or is it Gerber? Because they're all saying that they're giving high doses of le uh, uh, iron to your baby. But only Gerber is actually having little tiny iron shavings in their, in their formula. So someone's getting really good doses of iron and someone's not. Yeah, if it was just iron, that's that's one thing. But yeah, if it's lead, that that's the end of the road. I mean, yeah. And again, this woman could be a KGB agent. We don't know. We we just can't know that. But she seemed like a typical soccer mom. But who who am I? Well, on to the waste walker segment of the episode. <laughs> Adding to all of this. I'm sure some of you guys that follow some of the financial aspects of what's going on in the United States. This past week, we got the CPI numbers, which is a consumer price index, which measures how much prices are fluctuating. So basically an inflation metric. And it shows that it rose to 3.5%, or if you're looking at the core, CPI is 3.8%. But it's increasing. So what this tells us is that the Fed is not going to be lowering interest rates, or at least it doesn't seem to such. And then also the job reports came out the previous week, which shows an, high, an extremely high increase, up to 303,000 jobs, and unemployment dropped down to 3.8%. So what this tells us is that- Biden the, is doing a good job. Uh, that, that's actually what Janet Yellen came out and said, which is our uh, treasury secretary, and says, hey, the economy is doing great. I think we can feel great about our economy. I was going to ask you what you made of this last jobs report. Well, it just shows that U.S. is firing on all cylinders. Um, consumers are holding up some low-income consumers um, or perhaps exhausting their buffers of saving that they built up during the pandemic. We're seeing a little bit more distress at the household level there. But generally, households are in very good financial sh shape. Things can always happen. There's always recession risk. Geopolitical developments could um, create risk to our economy. But I think we've got a good, strong economy that's on a solid track. And it's like, yeah, tell that to all the people who can't afford anything. But yeah, it's they good. Did. <laughs> <I know. laughs> they did. Tell. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what they did say. But that's what I'm saying. It's absolutely insane because... This is the metric that the, the Federal Reserve looks at. So what they're looking at, like I've talked about many times before, they're looking at the idea is if people lose their jobs, like job, the job growth decreases and unemployment increases, this gives the Fed a good metric that whatever they were doing is working and people now have less money. Because if you don't have a job, you're going to have less money, right? 
But it's it's almost like this quandary of stagflation. Stagflation is different than inflation and deflation because stagflation is where people are losing their jobs, but prices are still increasing and the economy is kind of staying steady. But what's funny is, is that we're not seeing that uh, on paper. Of course, this is what they're reporting to us on paper. Jobs are increasing. Unemployment is going down and inflation is going up. But inflation is correlated with income. If people have more money, they have more money to spend. And so if you have more money to spend, clearly prices can go up because you can afford more expensive products because you have a lot of money. But if everybody don't have money, clearly they have to drop prices because nobody's got no money. So it's interesting that on paper, they want to show everybody the economy is great, guys. So we can't really fix inflation. So this kind of forces them to keep prices high. At least corporations can use that as a justification. So everybody, this is why the stock market tanked the other day, was because when this report came out, everybody's been waiting for interest rates to go down because no, this is part of the housing pro- conflict. Of course, the real issue of the housing conflict is that there's not enough supply. There's not enough houses available because nobody wants to sell their house because nobody wants 7 to 8% mortgages when they have 3 4 5%. So they want interest rates to come down so people will sell their houses, put more inventory on the market, and this transfer of housing can occur so people can sell, like older people will sell their bigger houses, go into smaller houses, and they'll be okay with that because interest rates is like 5% or something. They don't want to transfer into an 8%, 7% mortgage. But the Fed now has no incentive to reduce rates because they're saying inflation is still too high. And so this seems like this infinitive problem that I think they're just going to keep propagating. And because the thing that we've been talking about for a while is commercial real estate mortgages is all coming up to be due. Like just in 2024, this year, there's about a trillion, 929 billion, about a trillion dollars of commercial mortgages that are due this year. But nobody's wanting to go back work at the office. And so the idea is, is what incentive does corporations have to re-up or refinance or reallocate their leases if nobody wants to come back to work? It's just going to be spending money with empty buildings. So they're not going to uh, renew their leases or they're just going to default in their properties and and write it off as a tax write-off. So who's going to be left with all these buildings with defaults? The banks. So this past week, the FBI, the FDIC chairman came out saying, he actually just clearly stated, the U.S. is ready for a big Wall Street bank failure. And if there is a failure, we have a plan on how to fix it. So why would they say that unless they're anticipating some kind of plan? Like They just want to be careful and they want to they plan ahead. Just want to make sure that we have enough money in our banks. Well, if you guys look at it, the largest holders of these commercial real estate loans, you would think they're like Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, you know, all these large banks, but that's not the case. The largest holders of commercial real estate loans are small banks, local banks, community banks, regional banks. They hold the majority of these. So if commercial real estate loans default, the ones that are going to be affected the most are small banks. And maybe a lot of people don't realize why there's a beneficial factor of having small banks and then large national bank. Like large national banks like Wells Fargo and Citibank and all of that, they don't have a real connection within your smaller communities. So if small businesses want to start up like a a landscaping company or if there was like a, uh, you know, some community outreach project, these larger banks, they don't have any incentive to loan money for that. Because they don't care. It's not making them a lot of money. But small community banks, regional banks, they work within the community because they're a part of that community and they give capital to these uh, local resources. But if all the small banks get chopped out, all these smaller communities are going to lose the access to capital. And this is what I was thinking is the larger scheme. And, And so when think about last year. We talked about it. Silicon Bank and Signature Bank collapsed last year. And those were crypto-centered banks. So who bought Signature Bank? It was uh, the New York City Bank, which is a large bank. And so they bought it up. 
But this past, this past, I think earlier January, they almost collapsed also. So then Steve um, Mnuchin, Mnuchin, Steve Mnuchin, which was uh, our old secretary treasury during Trump's time. He ha- he's a part of a large investment group. I think it's called Liberty Capital Funding. But he put a billion dollars into New York Capital Bank, New York City Bank, to make sure they didn't collapse. See, I thought this was ironic. If you, ever, if you guys go back and look at Steve Mnuchin, Mnuchin, while he was the secretary treasurer, he was talking all this bad stuff about crypto. But then all of a sudden, he hires Brian Brooks, which we've talked about before also. And Brian Brooks was the chief, I think, financial officer of Coinbase. And he assigns Brian Brooks as the first attorney or first a general of the Office of Comptroller. Which in the United States, the Office of Comptroller is a group of people that control all the regulations of all the banks in the United States. And so so what I'm saying is it's interesting that Mnuchin decides to hire Coinbase, which is the United States' PSYOP for crypto, as the person who's supposed to control how all the banks in the United States operate. And so then I thought it was interesting that the person who saves New York City Bank is Steve Mnuchin. And I was like, why does he care about Citibank? It's because Signature Bank were crypto banks. This all, all goes back to the Great Fire idea. Crypto banks. And so if there is something inside Signature Bank that incriminates Mnuchin or the government because they're connected with high derivatives within the crypto market during 2021 to 2023 and because brian brooks was from coinbase and then he put him as the first attorney or first general of the office of comptroller there could have been this intermingling and the only way to hide that from getting to the public is by not allowing that to get into foreclosure so if new york city bank closes or gets into foreclosure or goes into hands that don't have this idea of secrecy it can get exposed. So then Steve Mnuchin puts a billion dollars in there to make sure that New York City Bank continues. And so there's this big guys within this crypto scheme, but also within this commercial real estate scheme. So then the larger thought process is why does commercial real estate mortgages play any play or defaults play any play into the United States government? Because they forgot to burn Epstein's Island. Well, that's what I was trying, like the illusion is, is the way of a digital fire or, you know, to make sure it gets deleted is if you own that digital information, you could just delete it. You can hit the delete button. No, not if it has a firewall. I don't know if you guys remember the bank term funding program. It just ended. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. And what that bank fund fund and the only reason that bank fund uh, term funding program even existed was because of Silicon Valley and Signature Bank's collapse. And so at that time, everybody thought, oh, wow, all these because those are smaller banks, even though they're pretty big, they're smaller banks, they're regional banks, like like community local banks. And so they were like, well, people are going to have a bank run. Everybody's going to start taking their money out and there's no cash to give. So the Federal Reserve created this thing called the bank term funding program. So that these smaller banks can get instantaneous loans so they can have liquidity for people who wanted to do withdrawals so there wouldn't be a bank run. But now that's ended. So now these smaller banks are back into vulnerability. And then again, who is the person that's going to collapse if all these commercial real estate loans uh, default? It's going to be these same banks that now don't have access to this bank term funding program. So it's almost like they saved the banks that were going to collapse because it wasn't time yet. But now they took away that program knowing that they're still vulnerable because it's almost like it's time for them to collapse because the only people who have the highest liability are these smaller banks. Because if they wanted them to continue being saved, just keep the bank term funding program running. Keep it running. But they, this past month, like in March, They shut it down. It's over. 
So it seems too coincidental that we have all these commercial mortgages due. Last year, I think it was half a trillion. This year, it's going to be one trillion. And it just keeps going up and up. And unless these loans get, these leases get renewed or these mortgages get paid, they're going to default, which is going to force all these small banks to shut down. Well, it's a good thing that, what was the guy's name that came out with that speech? He's saying that we're prepared. If, if it was hypothetically, if it was going to happen, we are prepared. It's the FDIC chair. Yeah. So, uh, it's a good, I mean, it, so they are, they are looking out. You know, much of these banks, they don't only hold commercial real estate loans. What else do they hold? They hold personal residential assets too. They hold mortgages, like if you go get a house mortgage. So they have single family home loans. So not only, so the idea for me is what's the game? The game plan is collapse and consolidate. This is going to be the beginning of Waste Walkers. So if the smaller banks right now give easy capital access to local communities, like small businesses or whatever, small communities still have a means to thrive and grow. But if all these smaller banks get collapsed and bought up, so consolidate into the larger banks, there's only going to be like five to seven large national banks like Chase, Wells Fargo, you know, whatever. And they're going to be able to buy all these assets at pennies on the dollar. And of course, they're going to have to suck up the risk of commercial mortgages. But the real end game also is that under that guise, they're going to be able to get all the small family homes also. So, you know, because there's been this boogeyman that's been propagated that we got to be careful because large equity firms and large banks are buying up all single family homes because they're trying to control the rent market and the housing market. So they're trying to put this guys out there. Oh no, we're not doing that guys. We're not trying to do that. But if they can hide their takeover through commercial mortgage collapses, they're going to by default get those home mortgage loans too. So all these smaller community banks that have all these small mortgage loans, when they buy up the, commu the commercial real estate loans, they're going to get all those assets and then they're going to have a higher control over the housing market and rental market also. Then there's a larger scheme to all of this. So then the larger scheme is what is the government going to do? Because this is going to create money printer 2.0. This, this, is, this is just an easy guise for the Fed to turn on the money printer. And then this is going to cause bank buyout 2.0, like we saw in 2008, the bank bailouts. But what else is this going to do? Because this is going to get cyclical. So Biden and other people know that they want foreign companies like TSCM, the largest, most powerful AI chip producer that's in Taiwan in the world to come to Arizona and other places in the United States and build factories here. But everything's expensive. It's commercial property. But if the commercial property sector collapses, this stuff is going to go on fire sell. And who's going to be able to get this on pennies on the dollar? So then the government's going to give incentives to company, banks to sell a large commercial real estate property and access to companies like TSCM for pennies on the dollar, incentivizing them to come here. And then they're going to subsidize the banks through a bailout through Congress, raising our national debt by saying, we need to help this so we can continue our economy to grow. And then what's going to happen is all these smaller banks, CEOs, they're going to start new banks. Because they already filed bankruptcy. And then they're going to go back and buy those same loans that they sold and defaulted. They're going to buy back when they start new banks on pennies on the dollar. And so it's like this infinitive money loop. They filed bankruptcy, so they sold it on pennies on the dollar. And they didn't have any liability because they filed bankruptcy. And then when all of this goes on for a couple of years, like 2007, 2027, 2028, those same CEOs can start new small regional banks and then rebuy those commercial loans at even pennies on the dollars even more with no liability. And this is all going to be subsidized by the Congress on the back of taxpayer dollars. And it's just going to raise the national debt and inflate our currency even more. And then we're going to have higher interest rates on a continual basis 
while all these banks still now have the majority control single family homes. So what that's going to cause is an infinitive controlling of the housing market prices and rent prices. And because they're not going to grow the inventory of houses, housing prices is going to still be too high. Interest rates are still going to be too high and you're going to own nothing and you're going to like it. Because another thing that can happen once you take away small regional banks, some cities aren't going to be able to have access to capital. You might actually see cities, whole cities foreclose, but then you can find large equity companies or banks buying whole cities because all the regional banks have lost access to capital. So the only people that have access to capital to loan money, it's kind of like what happened to Greece. It's kind of the same thing. Let's say Dallas don't have money or that's too big, like smaller off skirt cities don't have enough money because the capital banks are all sold out and the commercial real estates are all sold out. You can find large banks like Wells Fargo coming in and saying, hey, we'll offer you a loan so you can keep your city going. But theoretically, now the landlord of that city is Wells Fargo. And so, or some big billionaires may buy whole cities and create smart cities. So this is an easy entryway to just literally start whole smart cities because now everything is pennies on the dollar. So I think this is the largest scheme and this is going to take at least until 2028, 20, 2030, but whoever the next president is, whoever it is, it doesn't matter who it is. I think that this is going to fall on their lap. Do you think they foresee all this coming? The presidents? I don't know. That was probably an extensive um, idea because in 2008, they never fixed the real problem. When the housing market collapsed, they didn't build more houses. And so we're right now, the housing issue is because we didn't fix the inventory problem. And so now we're just dealing with inventory issues. And, and, and to me, this seems premeditated. All they got was bank bailouts and incentives, but there was never really large or huge or large enough based upon population growth. There's supposed to be a correlation of housing inventory, but that has separated more than being come correlated, which means they didn't fix the issue. So that's why we're still having that problem to this day. And then when interest rises, that correlation even gets farther. Because if there's too high of an interest, nobody has an incentive to buy, which creates the divide even longer. So I think this, it, to me, it seems all premeditated and they're using commercial real estate loans as a guise to get more of the single family homes without being demonized as the boogeyman. And that's how they can ultimately create the smart cities and you'll like it. You'll be happy. And they ultimately will be able to control the housing and rental market and you'll be happy. Because you're going to see the recession turn more and more into a recession, possibly a depression. But it, will it really be a depression or will it continue this illusion of depression or recession, which is basically a stagflation? How many people do you think knows about all this information? Like, do you think there's a documentary on this or do you think Whitney Webb knows about this? I haven't heard anybody talk about this longer collusion. Everybody talks about the economy collapsing. I just pointed out to you one by one on how I, how it will happen. So you guys, and I'm, I'm, this is almost like prophetic. Like I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time that this is what I think. So you will see this. I did this with the whole Bitcoin BTF thing, the ETF thing. If you guys remember one by one though, this is what I think you will see happening over time. And so that's why you're going to continue hearing this rhetoric like this year too. Just listen on the news. You're going to hear this commercial mortgage default, commercial, commercial loans are, are, are coming up. Leases are not getting renewed. And then you're going to see smaller banks suffering when they don't, because they're the ones that hold the majority of these commercial loans. And as they collapse, you're going to have to see the Fed do something because bank runs are real if there's no liquidity. Because imagine if you had all this money in your bank. And then you heard that your bank's actually going to go bankrupt. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to go to your bank and withdraw your money. But what if they say, we ain't got no money? Uh, yeah. And, and the Fed don't want that. That looks horrible. So they're going to have to create some liquidity here. So what they're going to do is try to encourage larger banks to buy out those smaller banks so that the liquidity can, can, can exist because those larger banks are going to provide the cash for your withdrawals. But then those larger banks are going to feel the stress and they're going to tell the Fed, what are we going to do? And here comes the bank bailout 2.0.
It's, I mean, I'm telling you, you're going to see it happening one by one. And yeah, it probably take till 2027, 2028, but it's happening. It'll be just in time. Yeah. I think the whole accumulation will manifest in totality by 2030. But that's my idea of the waste walkers. That's why I coined this off, uh, episode that because I think eventually that's what you will see. And this is not going to just affect the United States. This is going to affect the whole world because the economy, I don't care what people want to push about bricks and everything else. The whole world economy is still centralized around the dollar. And if you watch the DXY, you can see, which is the value of the dollar. Um, countries are feeling this too. So a lot of these countries, as they sell off reserves, because the 10-year yield is, is going up. And so there's a correlation between the 10-year yield and... Um, countries feeling a risk so if there's higher risk on the dollar like something could be happen you're actually going to see there's going to be there's a year yield inversion but you're, you're just gonna you're gonna watch these things slowly happen and i think this is just a plan so that nobody think about the wealth gap so in 1950 the at how much do you think was the average yearly income for the average household in 1950,000 20, Three thousand three hundred dollars a year, but how much do you think a house cost in nineteen thousand? Seven thousand five hundred. Wow! So you can pay it off in two years, right? It only took two and a half years. What is the average income in twenty twenty four for a household? Fifty thousand. Sixty thousand. What is the average house price in twenty twenty four? One million four hundred and thirty thousand. So that's seven to seven and a half years. That means the wealth gap has increased two hundred percent. Because the, the, the idea of middle class is property ownership. And that's how you say, I'm a middle class person because you own your house. That's the idea. It's now 200% more difficult to become part of the middle class than it's ever been, which means there is no middle class. Uh, what, what if I own my own trailer? Well, you know, you're still lucky because property uh, just- uh, well, I mean, Would I be middle class? Maybe I would still say so. I would still quantify that because I, I don't think middle class is so much defined by uh, monetary uh, number. Like you have X amount of dollars. I do. I do believe the majority, even the elites, see independency, in pro which is property ownership. It's somewhat. Of course, you don't want to totally own it. Property tax, yeah, yeah. But independency as a means of saying you are not under government dependency, so you're a middle class citizen. But as they try to make that divide wider. By creating the separation between your income and the access to buy property, the middle class is going to be gone. Nobody is going to be able to buy property. And that's the whole scheme of saying you will own nothing and you'll like it. And that's the, the beginning of the waste walkers. You're going to be walking in a wasteland where currency is going to be all over the place. But to reach this middle class divide is going to be impossible. Well, that's why we are waste watchers. We're actually watching the waste unfold, but we're not waiting for nothing. So we're not, we're not waiting to watch. We're actually waste watchers, plants. Yeah. Well, anyways, you guys can tell me what you guys think about all that. I, I summarized what I was going to talk about. So it wasn't too intense. I wrote out like this whole thing that I. So that was just a summary. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could have just, I was good planning on just reading it off directly what I wrote, but instead I just summarized it. But those are the technical points, you know, and if people have contrary ideas or if you guys see uh, things that may differ from what I was talking about, please put them in the comments, put them in the chat and I will, or go to the discord. I'll be more than happy to talk about it, but I don't see any solution around this. And I think it's been made this way. And I think they used the pandemic on purpose to do this because the pandemic was the first time they had access to say, we need remote work. We can't work in the office, which gave the ability for them to test the idea of how long can we push out commercial real estate necessity? And can we use this as a scheme to take over the citizens independency, which is some, some form of property ownership? And so I, I think that's how they're going to hide it. They're going to say, we need to save the banks. And as they save the banks, they're not only going to take commercial real estate, they're going to take residential properties. Welcome to the waste walkers. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that, that's what I was going to bring to the table. I thought it was time for just a uh, financial <laughs> update. <laughs> so if you guys tuned into TTTV, uh, there was your financial update of the quarter. Uh, I will probably bring another one in June. <laughs> or if there's any other large uh, fluctuations that I think are pertinent, but take that for what it is. But before we transfer over to the live section, Polly, will you, will you do us the honor and bring one more of those great magic tricks out of your hat? Apparently, um, you guys have probably heard of this guy who is talking to aliens. I'm not talking about Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer is also talking to aliens, but there's a lot of people that we've known about for quite some time that have been talking to aliens. Here is uh, one of them. Oh, <laughs> wow. Is this a mental institution? <laughs> no. He's the central control. This is Central Control. This is Central Control. Stand by. I'm waiting. I think he is he all right. Central Control. <laughs> lost connection. This is Eddie. Central Control. This is. <laughs> He's choking. Oh. Somebody oh. stop me. Um, so that's one guy. Here's another one. Just giving you... I'm just making your mouth wet. And so, Earth humans, we would like to announce the coming of our ships in your dimension. Our interdimensional ships are entering in through your portal spaces. Our beingness, our physical incarnations, or quasi-physical, as we may term them, because we can operate in other dimensions, are entering into your realm a variety of portals such as this at this time on your earth and so Earth humans, <laughs> wow. you would like to end- welcome okay, so there's um all right <laughs> <laughs> where do you find this stuff uh in on earth honestly uh, and then now here's the latest guy this guy's probably the most popular he's probably up there with stephen greer level i couldn't find any stephen greer footage of him um talking to aliens so this is the best I can find. These are probably his disciples. But here's another guy. This guy, I think, is uh, on the top notch. My name is Daryl Anka, and for the past 40 years, I have... Uh, that guy does look like the Coneheads. ...terrestrial entity that we call Bashar. Bashar. Bashar is a first contact specialist from his civilization, which is called Esasani, which is in a parallel reality. <laughs> Be careful, it almost sounds like the SSI. ...reality with ours, his planet would be about 500 light years in the direction of the Orion constellation. He's brought through a lot of information to us over the last 40 years, and we're going to explore and share some of that... This is one of those, like, neural beat frequencies. I'm trying to get you tranced in, him yeah. tapped in. Mind freak. I had two broad daylight UFO sightings here over Los Angeles, which started investigating the idea of what that was all about and led me to the understanding that Bashar and I have made an agreement to do this channeling before this life. So we would like to present that information to you in this series. I did a channeling with my head wired to a brainwave machine, EEG machine. And there were many unusual things that happened <laughs> in my brain. This guy's legit. Mm. State. One of the most profound Probably working with the WEF. There are certain centers of the brain that are responsible. Probably for working with the WTF. Processing the personality. <laughs> During the, uh, the World Trade Frequency. My personality center is shut off. So if I'm not there, who's speaking? So here we have a you picture know, of what there's, is there's doctors that can answer that for you. Channel. And you can see the areas in blue, the functional Broadman areas, we call them, um, that are not used when he is channeling. And it appears that he disconnects from his personal Whoa. sense of self. <clears throat> he disconnects oh. from Gonna re atomize as, oh. a, as a whole other being. Is when he begins to channel Whoa. is, first of all, his processing speed. 
and processing speed Whoa. is a very interesting and there's nothing to see here and we we know we're not lobbied and bought out by nobody this is actually on her computer oh. i think she's probably licensed uh, she's tapped into stargate he's probably got her license mm. and app out point doesn't usually change during the lifetime and in Daryl's case, it actually went up when he began to change. Whoa. And it increased when he listened. The so, yeah, th this guy, uh, I just forgot his name. Bashar? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's who he's talking to. Bashar, apparently, according to him, is a being that's doing what he's doing, but on, his, on that planet, 500 light years away or whatever he said. Um, so they're connecting intergalactically. I don't think we need any of that. I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of books out there that can tell you some information, but not about Bashar. No, not and, like these. Or the, you know, what are we talking about? They're from the planet SSI. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so Ulysses S. Grant. You gotta be careful. Well, I wanted to show you guys him in action, um, without the brainwaves, you know, all, Jokes aside, him in his full glory. Yeah, Bashar. So I give you Bashar. And listen to this music. Yeah, do you believe in Channers? <laughs> Don't say good day to you this day of your time. How are you all? It is the beginning, <laughs> is it not? How are you all? Like remind you of the essence of the soul. We are appreciative of the opportunity to Why be do they have to talk to like you, this? Who you may ask. We thank you for the co-creation of the interaction. Please proceed however you so desire. I didn't I need permission, but... You it's know, because you don't believe in channers. No, it's like, you know, you could run this whole scheme. You don't have to go like, and eh, now I sound like a 1950s robot. It's like, that's not necessary. <laughs> the Tibetan woman. Yeah. They always have to have that same accent. And I don't know why. It's like, you can, you know, psychics do this. You know, the, what do you call those? Like the, uh, those Tara people, you know, they don't change Tara, their. Tara, Tara, Tara readers. Yeah. You get Tara your, readers. You get your hand read oh, or well, something. Tarot card. Yeah. Readers, it's like, yeah. you know, they don't change their voice or anything. They just read you and they give you some, you know, exhortative, uh, words. They don't turn into alien man. It's like these people literally convert into like a 1950s, you know, space galactica movie. It's like, nah, welcome. Nah, nah, nah. It's like, that's not even necessary. Yeah. But those guys, those, the palm readers and all them that you're talking about, they don't actually channel their other po personality. Like these guys can at, at will cha cha uh, channel or channer. Channeling. Yeah, it says Channer on his thing. Uh, maybe it's a misspelling. Anyway, uh, he's able to channel his other personality. Like, you know, if you have split personalities. Yeah, what I was going to say is to get like DID. It seems like it. And that, you know, that would explain why part of his brain shuts off. <laughs> I, I guess. Hey, look, Again, I don't know if that woman had a license, but. Well, anyways, you guys can tell us what you think about that in the uh, comments and in the <laughs> chat. But I appreciate you bringing us that to our insight and um you know hopefully you're nobody's buying their uh nine even greer hat 999 dollar programs well yeah i mean hey this is these guys are doing what stephen greer is doing so and like i said i was gonna i was gonna go real deep so i i warned you ahead of hey, time look uh, i like say, the chair by it i'll guy. say even with stephen greer at least he doesn't turn into the 1950s coneheads. Well, see, we don't know. I've, I, I've, I've tried to find footage. I can't find footage of him doing his... Uh, well, no, I'm saying Stephen channeling. Greer talks to... He makes interviews. He's been in front of Congress. Yeah, I know, but he doesn't have anything where he's actually channeling. Like, no. he does channel. He does this stuff, but we don't have any footage of him. And maybe it's because he's shy. Uh, could have be you shy. heard that? I never heard him do channeling. Yeah, he actually says he channels. Even Greer? Yeah, I have videos. Well, I did have videos. I didn't put, bring them up. Well, that's interesting. There's yeah. no there's no videos of him actually doing the channeling, but he says he channels these things through meditation. And he actually has classes on how to do it. He'll give you the classes, but he never shows any footage of him actually doing it. He yeah, actually I, has a lot of classes on how to channel these things. And I'm not promoting. I don't, I don't know. I don't I have low levels of believing his legitimacy, but I just never heard of him anything of such but yeah i i just have that question for anybody who's doing into these alien channels <laughs> tapping in why does it have to sound like 1950s coneheads I, I don't understand almost feels like a saturday night skit 
Uh, but anyways, we appreciate that colleague and hopefully you guys enjoyed this week's episode, episode 98, Waste Walkers. Hopefully you guys are ready for the incoming takeover that they've been telling you about for a long time. Alien Agenda. Invasion. Agenda 2030. <laughs> But anyways, as always, please hit that like button right now if you haven't. Smash the love button. Hit that like button if you haven't, please. That helps us. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't had a chance yet. Hit that join button. Become a TTTV member, which provides uh, us more resources to continue making more content like this. And as always, please leave some comments. Go into the Discord. And uh, again, if you guys have any questions about anything I was talking about, about the financial sector, uh, I'll try to answer those questions also. I- I'm intrigued on what people think about uh, the future of our economy. But anyways, as always, we enjoyed you guys' time. And until next time, this is TTTV signing out.